Good evening, I'm Nev Van Pelt and thank you for joining us. Tourism Thunder Bay recently provided an update to City Council reviewing 2023 and outlying priorities for 2024. That presentation included a strong focus on sports tourism. Cruise ship traffic was highlighted as an important part of growing Thunder Bay's tourism in the years ahead. It also looked at hotel occupancy rates, which dropped nearly 3% last year. However, the local rate is still higher than the majority of other Canadian cities. Tourism manager Paul Pepe then turned attention to sports tourism. With those events creating a $9 million economic impact last year, Pepe says it's important to invest in these types of events. Sports, I think in general, is an area of growth for us and, and with the Tourism Development Fund, as I said earlier, it's a very powerful tool to help us and allow us to support local sport organizations and sport leaders to bring more of these national and international events into Thunder Bay. So certainly something we want to see more of and, uh, and the fund is a perfect tool for helping support sport tourism overall. Pepe concluded by mentioning the upcoming Women's Baseball World Cup this summer in Thunder Bay as something that should boost the local tourism sector. Northern Development Minister Greg Rickford made several funding announcements in his riding this week. The Kenora Chiefs Advisory is getting over $700,000 to create a new primary health team, and Rickford was also handing out money in Fort Francis. The Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is providing $487,000 to the town of Fort Francis to create a new waterfront tourist attraction. It will feature two historic logging tugboats, the Hallett and the Wandam, which date back to the early 1900s. The town will use the funding to further restore the tugboats, design a dry dock to display them, and landscape the waterfront. When it's completed, the exhibit will highlight the importance and history of logging around the Rain Rainy River. With a solar eclipse happening on Monday, Science North is excited to celebrate the legendary event. The Sudbury location is set to host a viewing party, and CTV's Tony Rima spoke with senior scientist Amy Henson leading up to it. Explain the best way to view the eclipse. Absolutely. So there's all kinds of different ways you can view the eclipse. We're very fortunate that we have some of these here at Science North for our viewing party day, and hopefully we'll be able to take a look at the sun through these. These are very special viewing glasses. They have a very important certification. It's called an ISO certification on them. And this pair of glasses will block out a majority of the light, except for that really round ball, which is the sun. And we'll be able to to see the sun through those glasses, but actually nothing else. They're very, very, very dark. And they, these glasses are what helps make it safe for us to view the sun directly. But there's all kinds of ways that you can view the eclipse without having one of these special pair of glasses. And one of the things that we're making this weekend here at Science North is a projection viewer like this. And it's very simple. It's made out of a cardboard box, some tape, there's a little hole cut in there, there's a piece of paper taped here at the back, and a piece of aluminum foil right here taped to the front with a little hole in. And so if you have your back towards the sun and you take a look through this hole, you'll be able to see a projection of the sun and the shadow of the moon moving over that sun. And you can watch the entire eclipse in a box, in a way. All right, if you don't have those special glasses or the pinhole camera, are there other ways to watch the eclipse without damaging your eyes? Absolutely, we always recommend indirect viewing. So, and that can be done a myriad of different ways. It can be done with even a kitchen colander with round holes in it. You could put that sort of on the ground, let the sun uh, shine down, create a little uh, shadow on the ground. But all those little light holes that are in that colander will create a little mini eclipse that you can see. And the most simplest thing you can do is get a piece of paper, punch a hole in the middle, and use that as a shadow again on the ground. And that little hole will make the eclipse project right on the ground for you. As many people do their grocery shopping this weekend, new data shows Canadians are blaming big business for the rising prices in the aisles. It comes as competition across the country is drawing political ire. CTV's Colton Prale reports. When it's not housing or the carbon tax, how you doing? Thanks, guys. Opposition parties are using Canadian competition, or the lack thereof, to score political points against the Liberals. Today, the monopoly problem is threatening Canada. It's threatening the free market economy, and it's threatening Canada's future. In the push to improve affordability, big business profits are under the spotlight, especially at the grocery store. We also see another record being broken, record profits for corporate grocery stores. 
New polling shows 32% of Canadians blame grocery stores for rising food prices, more than any other contributor. Some economists say that blame is misplaced. Improving foreign worker programs, training more truck drivers, harmonizing trucking regulations, all of those have an identifiable cost impact on increasing the price of food. But competition is a concern in Canada. Cellular prices are among the highest in the world. And last week, a push from the NDP for an inquiry into oil and gas price gouging, something the Competition Bureau continues to monitor. As long as people are grumpy and struggling to pay the bills, it's not good for any incumbent party. Ottawa has made progress updating the Competition Act in December. But experts say the government can do much more. Uh, price regulation, for example, in areas like housing uh, or in energy. Uh, other countries have tried those and found that they, in fact, worked uh, more directly and more effectively. The Liberals are pushing back on the latest prong of attack, blaming the Conservatives for holding up legislation that would further amend the Competition Act, something they say will have a direct impact on affordability and monopolies across the country. Colton Prail, CTV News. Ottawa. Cancer treatment can impact the body, mind, and one's physical appearance. To support those affected, the charity Look Good, Feel Better is providing services for affected women to help them make, make them feel like themselves again. The organization's main activity is volunteer-led in-person workshops. They teach makeup, skincare, and hair alternative techniques. The workshop also helps address the social and emotional changes that women may go through during treatment. Locally, workshops are held every Wednesday between 6.30 and 8.30 in the regional's hospital Tameric House. Team leader Jennifer Bencharski says look good, feel good better helps women find their identity again. While it is important for males also, I think females definitely feel those effects a lot more. Um, if you have long hair and you lose it, that's a huge identifying piece of them that's gone or um, their eyelashes and their eyebrows, so having an opportunity for them to learn how they can address those so that they can look better and then feel better about themselves while they're going through treatment. You can register for a workshop online at lgfb.ca. Bencharski adds they're also looking for volunteers to help lead the workshops. Operating family-owned business is a big undertaking, and to do it successfully for 80 years really requires the right tools. McEachern's Tool House is celebrating its 80th anniversary. From small hand tools to large contracting equipment, the business had expanded and adapted during the four generations that the McEachern family has been running it. Their humble roots as a small tool shop on May Street really puts their growth into perspective. As their current Vickers Street location is now the largest dealer of DeWalt products in all of northwestern Ontario. Keel McEachern is the latest generation of his family to work in the business and he spoke about how important it is to serve the needs of the community. To adapt and change depending on the uh, market need in uh, Northern Ontario and uh, develop relationships with various businesses over the time. There's something for everybody. Maybe you don't need the tools and you're not building anything, but you got to maintain a yard or do something along those lines. So we're there to help with that, all that kind of stuff. For those looking to see what McEachern's Tool House currently offers, they're participating in the Spring Home and Garden Show this weekend at the CLE Grounds. They will also be hosting a special DeWalt Day event on June 6 as part of their 80th anniversary celebrations. The weather was warm and the water was cold, perfect for the hundreds jumping into Lake Superior earlier today. The Polar Plunge was another huge success, with the event having more than 400 plungers and raising double its funding goal. Jessica Clement has the details. It's that time of year again when brave souls jump into the freezing Lake Superior, all for a good cause. Two, <laughs> Over 400 people took part in the 12th annual Polar Plunge Saturday afternoon, with hundreds more watching on the sidelines and on the live stream. This year's plunge looked a little bit different, with plungers having to jump into seven feet deep water, but some weren't phased. Amazing. It was just, I, I live for jumping into cold water, so it, I knew this was a challenge I wanted to take on. When you first hit the water, your breath is stolen for just a second, and then this whole flush of warm, just like, oh wow, amazing, just comes over you on this beautiful sunny day. Yeah. 
And despite the freezing water, plungers said participating in the event was a no-brainer. When we saw all the wonderful organizations that it would benefit, we jumped on board and we thought it's a great team building for our group and we love getting involved in community events. The causes are like near and dear to my heart. I've uh, worked with a lot of the community and, and the sports that uh, we're benefiting today. A fundraising record was broken once again, with the event raising over $155,000, doubling its $75,000 fundraising goal. Like previous years, the plunge was in support of the Special Olympics, the CNIB, Pro Kids, and Roots Community Food Center. Roots Executive Director Aaron Beagle says the support from the community makes it all worthwhile. The funding that comes in from this helps these four charities in so many ways all year round because it's so much funding. Um, so then we can say yes to helping more kids in sports. We can say yes to feeding more meals. We can say yes to more like removing barriers. And um, and we like we come to rely on it a little bit now too. So you know, like everybody, like the feeling that I get is people are thankful to be here. People are excited to be here. Um, people are so generous with their donations and with their like enthusiasm. Like you've seen the costumes that they're doing. Like they're not just plunging. They're like kind of living it up to to really get behind it. Jessica Clement, TBT News. We're now joined by sports anchor Josh Morano. And Josh, the SIJHL second round is kicked off, and the local teams off to a pretty good start in round two. Yeah, not like our TBT News staff jumping into the cold <laughs> water, but the North Stars did get an action Friday. We'll have those highlights for you when we come back. Welcome back, and Josh, as we were saying, round two of the SIJHL playoffs is in action. They are in action. Cam River getting started tomorrow, but the Thunder Bay North Stars began their round two quest last night, matching up against the Sioux Lookout Bombers in a best of seven series. The Stars took care of business in the first round, but now face their toughest task, starting the series on the road. First period, North Stars shorthanded for an extended period of time following an Easton Gloucher double minor. This one to Nolan Palmer at the point. He lets it go and it beats Keenan Marks. Through the traffic and the Bombers continuing to do what they've done all playoffs long. Score first. They lead one to nothing. A couple minutes later, Bombers still on the power play. 
This one chipped ahead to Connor Rourke. Owen Rifle driving the net and Burke just throwing it right at him and he deflects it in. Rifle's fourth of the postseason gives the Bombers the two goal lead with both goals coming on the power play. They exit the first up two to nothing. However, Stars getting a chance on the power play now midway through the second frame. Cameron Dial in the slot, puts it on net. It's stopped by Jack Osman, but Alex Romenda is there to pot home the rebound. Stars answering back on the man advantage to get on the board. They cut the lead in half, but unfortunately unable to complete the comeback. They drop game one by a score of three to two, but are back in action tonight for game two and a chance to even the series before heading home. Over to the World Men's Curling Championship, and it was semi-final action earlier today. After Brad Guju and Team Canada booked their ticket yesterday following a pair of decisive wins, they match up this afternoon against Scotland with a finals berth on the line. Guju looking for his fifth final appearance in five outings with a win over 10 and two Scotland. First end, Canada with hammer. Guju looking at a tough tap for two. Watch for that guard, it's going to come in a hurry. Here they go. Have they got this line now? Keep it straight again. Here we go. Get it by the guard. Yes, you did. Have you seen enough? Can you move it far enough? Little bit more. Little bit more. One little bit more. Oh, brilliant start for Dying. Canada here in this first. Canada ain't no when starting with last rock up too early. In the sixth, it's Scotland with hammer tied at threes. Mowat with a draw against four, needing a piece of the forefoot, and it's going to come up way too short. A costly error leads to a steal of three, and Canada not looking back from there. They tack on three more, winning this one 9-4 to four and booking their finals ticket tomorrow against Sweden. Over to the NHL, and the race for the Art Ross is on with three players neck and neck for the lead. While Nikita Kucherov currently holds the lead, both Nathan McKinnon and Connor McDavid are hot on his trails as they took their race into their matchup last night. McDavid sitting at 97 assists and 126 points entering last night's contest. McKinnon, 130. First period, Darnell Nurse firing the shot from the point, and it's tipped in. Corey Perry, a former Hart Trophy winner, showing these new boys how it's done. His 901st career point, Oilers lead early. Late in the frame, McKinnon adding to his total. He finds Jonathan Drouin in the slot, and the one-timer beats Stuart Skinner. So McKinnon, 131 now on Drouin's 18th of the season, and we have a tie game. Still in the first, abs up 2-1. McDavid in behind the net, banks it off Alex Georgiev and in his eighth consecutive 30-goal season, and that is point number 127. Tied at twos, entering the second. Just seconds left, Oilers up one goal, and it's Evander Kane deflecting this one in. His first goal in 21 games. Talk about getting off the slump. He gives the Oilers the two-goal lead. Third period now, and it's McDavid again, nabbing his own pass and a chip shot over Georgiev. Point 128 on the season. Kane would score again as well as the Oilers clinch a playoff spot with a 6-2 win over the Avalanche. You know, we really buckled down after a really poor start, and um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of resiliency, resiliency and, and character in this group. Um, you know, it's 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 only one step, of course. We we know that, but um, you know, it's a step that that you need to do to to give yourself a chance. If you're looking. In November, late November, uh, things weren't looking great, but I think uh, as a group we, we had the belief that we know we can turn around and, and get in a roll here, and you know we did that and clinched the playoff spot, so it's, uh, it's a nice feeling, and now we got to try to win some more games to solidify home ice and who knows, maybe climb in the standings. The Toronto Maple Leafs welcome back Mitch Marner ahead of their matchup tonight against the Montreal Canadiens. The team went 7-4-1 in his absence with all lines clicking and head coach Sheldon Keith electing to spread out the offense, slotting William Nylander on the third line, Marner and John Tavares and Austin Matthews continuing to center Tyler Bertuzzi and Max Domi. I think we all take a lot of pride in whoever we play with to go out there and be effective, carry play, create opportunities and, and obviously uh, we have the ability to score, the players that have the ability to score. So, um, you know, for us it, it's... Uh, um, you know, show up and, and play to our standard and our team identity and, and uh, a lot of belief and trust in one another. I think that's what, that's what it takes to win. Um, obviously, uh, we're a couple weeks away. Um, last night was the night that we clinched the uh, playoff spot, so good feeling. And um, the last, whatever it is, seven games, I think we have left. Is that, is that seven? So use that to get ready to go, knowing that we're going to be there. And 
clean up some things, work on some details. And when it comes to, to playoff hockey, you need everyone, uh, not just three lines. You need four lines, and you need six defensemen. You need two goalies, and you need some extras as well that are going to jump in. So um, <clears throat> I think we're just gearing towards that and looking forward to the challenge. You know, and the reality is, I mean, we can talk about it, first line, second line, third line. The way I would like it to be is is that each, each game, uh, it could be different, you know. Uh, William's line could uh, could be the first line tonight. You know, I mean, it's you know, I think when you've got the talent spread out like that. It, it's more of a question of who's going on that particular night, and on great nights, all of them would be going. But um, you know, I think that's the idea: is that you've got it spread out and and uh, you know, get opportunities for for different lines to go. Last night was the Final Four in women's college basketball, and two teams, both with the resumes to make it to the finals, clash in a powerhouse matchup between Iowa and UConn. In her final season, Caitlin Clark looking to get back to the national championship game, but Paige Beckers and the Huskies trying to stand in her way. Second quarter, Iowa down seven. Clark has her pass stolen by Aaliyah Edwards. She walks in to the other end. Clark just six points in the first half and 0 oh, oh of 6 from 3. But Clark, well, she came alive in the second half. Clark looking to spin away from traffic. Double screen, gets open, and hits. First three of the night for Caitlin Clark. Stolke trying to get it to Clark. Does her three. Is good. Plus the foul. Here she comes, Iowa trailed by as many as 12, but Clark brings them back, all tied up, heading to the fourth quarter. And in the fourth, this one got spicy. Iowa now up two. Clark showing off the handle, steps back, nails the triple. She finished with 21 points, her 48th consecutive game with 20 plus. Iowa leading by seven, four to go. Clark turns it over, Huskies back the other way in transition. Beckers pulls up, drills it. She had 17 points on the night. Then with under a minute left, UConn down four. It's Nika Mule wide open for three. Nobody in sight, of course she hits it. UConn gets it within a point, but with under 40 seconds to go after an Iowa turnover, it's one last chance for UConn, down by one in the final 10 seconds. Now keep your eye on Edwards. She gets called here for the illegal screen. That's a tough call in the final seconds of this one. Takes the ball out of the Huskies' hands. Gino Oriyama is fuming. But Clark now on the free throw line with three seconds to go. And after making the first, Iowa up by two. Clark, she's going to miss the second. The Hawkeyes grab the rebound, though, and they hang on to win it. Clark and the Hawkeyes headed to the national championship game for a second straight year. Not surprised. Caitlin Not Clark is amazing. Best player on the planet. Closer than I thought, but she was lights out. Slow first half. But she really came down raining the threes. Lights out, kind of like the solar eclipse that oh, we're going to be seeing on Monday. Kind of like that, yeah. And speaking of Caitlin Clark making it rain, it's going to rain later this week. But we will get to that in your full weather forecast after the break.
Welcome back. And Josh, as we were saying, some rain coming later in the week, but a beautiful day today. Feels like spring. We're going to start out in the region where it's clear skies around most of it. Up north and a little bit in the west, there will be some clouds in the sky tonight, but a pretty warm night overall. Grand Portage will be the warmest at zero degrees. Fort Francis, Red Lake, and Sault Ste. Marie all seeing a low of minus 2. Armstrong and Greenstone will be the coldest in the region at minus 8. Atacokan and Sioux Lookout seeing minus 3. And as we go to tomorrow, those temperatures are going to warm up quite a bit. The sun is going to be shining around the region. Like we were saying, it's spring, it's here. Woohoo! A high of 10 in Greenstone, Marathon, Sault Ste. Marie, and Pickle Lake. Up in Red Lake and Kenora, it's going to be a high of 12. Fort Francis seeing the warmest temperature in the region with a high of 13. Dryden, 